Support Narrative's independent journalism at patreon.com forward slash narrative and check out our podcast wherever you get your podcasts and don't forget to subscribe and download. Hey everybody, welcome to Narrative Live. It's a Friday night. You've got nothing better to do, right? I hope. We're hanging out together for a little bit of time here as we put together another Narrative Live podcast. This is the taping, so anything can happen. I'm using new systems. Things might fall apart. I might have to restart. You guys know the drill by now, but uh, you seem to like being here, so it's good to have you along for the ride. Uh, Tonight's a really interesting show because we're going to break down a lot of the corruption that's going on right now around the pandemic around coronavirus. The terms, let me see, talk about starting again. All right, here we go. The term snake oil refers to Chinese medicinal exports from the 19th century. Basically, Chinese railroad workers working here in the United States and in uh, parts of the world use medicine made from the Chinese water snake. The medicine had purported to have, at least, uh, many cures for all our human ills. The claims turns out to be unsubstantiated, mostly, and in fact, many of them were just, uh, you know, exaggerated. Some of them maybe even completely fake, um, which brings us to what has always been known since then as the snake oil salesman. That's where the term comes from. Since then, we've had the fortunate intervention of science and research, which has resulted in regulatory bodies ensuring that, you know, we don't get sale- sold snake oil we get sold medicine when we go to the pharmacy. And there are safety standards that come along with that. And that's how we've been able to have scientifically proven and independent research and medicine that actually works for, you know, a couple of hundred years now. All of that changed, of course, when Donald Trump rode into town with his merry band of choose your terms, but I will use the word thieves in this case, because in just three years, they've been able to completely neuter the entire health government regulatory system. It's quite clear what they've done. They've been able to invade the system, tear apart all the safety guards and all the all the things that have made sure that we can ensure our medicine is healthy. They've torn it apart and they've done it all because, well, they've done it all because of money. Uh, Maybe there's more, but at least it appears like they've done it all because of money. And just in time, of course, just in time, they've been able three years to do all of this, break everything apart and just in time, Here comes the worst plague in a century or more in history. And what could be worse in this horrifying pandemic than a government that is either too dumb or too unwilling or too greedy to actually do anything about it? And that's how we got to the situation we are in today. Over a month ago, you'll remember I told you about the 19 days that changed the world when I was you know, staring at these at this period of time when Donald Trump kept denying the existence of something that was really there, saying it was going away, it was not a threat, the pandemic wasn't going to be that serious. And it seemed so obvious that it was going to be there and it was going to be a, a complicated thing for everyone to deal with. Yet, for some reason, Donald Trump decided he was going to delay, delay and delay. I'll tell you what that reason is later on in the show. We covered it in the last show, but I just want to plant it in your brain because we're going to go back to that a little bit later on. Now, while he did that, The legislature spent a lot of your money, $6 trillion of your money, to save the economy. And I think people forget this. People forget that this is not the government giving you money when they're sending you these checks. This is you giving you money. You know, the tax money that comes into the government comes from people like you working hard that pay your taxes. And that's how they have enough money to go and raise an additional $6 trillion to pay you to save the economy. People say it comes from China, it comes from all these other places. Yes, but it really is coming from you at the end of the day. So $6 trillion is a lot of money, by the way. I don't know how much money you were able to get out of uh, all these checks. Maybe you haven't got any. Some people have got larger larger bailouts because of uh, they've got payroll to, to support. Others have got basically $1,200, maybe some tax breaks here and there. Let's call it $2,000. Let's call it $2,000 a person. So on the back of an envelope or a, or a, a, a napkin, you might want to say uh, the calculation looks a little like this. For every person, let's say there's 330 million roughly in the United States, uh, you've paid in about $18,000 of your money or your future money, you've taken out a loan basically to save the economy, $18,000 of a loan. 
And that gives us all $6 trillion, which is what they spent to save the economy, or also what they think they spent. But you only got back $1,200 or $2,000 or whatever it is you got, but it was nowhere near um, the $18,000 that you loaned in order to save the economy. So the remaining $16,000 is going somewhere else. Yeah, of course, some of it's very legitimate, important uses. Most of it is legitimate, important uses, you'd hope. But you have to be at least suspicious that some of it is going to people who have you know, bad intent, who might be stealing things, who might be fraudulently using your money to further their own wealth. Now, if that person happens to live in the White House or is his son-in-law, it becomes even more problematic. And that is the situation we're facing today. The thing to remember with all this money is that $16,000 per person that you have provided to the government is meant to go to stopping this pandemic. A lot of it's meant to go to medication, to, to research, to treatments, to therapies, to figure out how we're gonna beat this pandemic. It's not meant to go to Donald Trump and it's not meant to go to Jared Kushner, which is how we get to the snake oil salesman of the 20th, of the 2020 is what I was trying to say and I blew that line, I'm gonna say it again. So which is how we get to the snake oil salesman of 2020. <laughs> I love that animation. I should tell you that I do all those myself and I love doing them, but it takes me an awful long time to get them right. But sometimes I just get a, an idea of what they look like and I, they should be uh, you know, interesting and grab people's attention. But that one's just a nice treatment because I uh, love the snakes. The symbols look pretty good. The sort of 70s uh, font. Anyhow, a little bit of backward, back uh, behind the scenes uh, information for me on how we put things together. But let's get back to the topic at hand, which is all about snake oil and they're salesmen. So I've always assumed that the, and maybe you have too, but I've always assumed that the responsibility to approve and regulate drugs in the United States belonged exclusively to the Food and Drug Administration. Now, it turns out that that's not the case. It turns out that there's all these other organizations which come into play when there's a federal emergency like there is now, or just in general, when there needs to be certain things done related to the, the food, the drugs, and uh, the disease control that we have in this country. Now, I'd never heard of BARDA until a few weeks ago. BARDA is one of those hidden authorities within a secretariat. So it's basically the Biomedical Advanced Research and Development Authority. It lives within the Department of Health and Human Services, and it's lived there for a long time, quite happily. Well, not that long, but a fairly long time. And it and it's normally operates in a sort of procedural, normal kind of way. However, the minute you get an emergency, these things get changed. Because when Donald Trump on, I think it was March the 13th, declared a national emergency around the pandemic, he gave the people who work at the FDA and the people who work at BARDA extraordinarily new powers, powers that they could use to regulate medication, that they could regulate research, it just supercharge what they could do without having to go through the normal application process, the normal procedures that would take to approve something. So if you're a snake oil salesman, this is pretty good, right? Because now you can get your snake oil approved by the FDA or the BARDA and no one's going to check it. In fact, they'll be thrilled about it and they'll write you trillion dollar checks because here's your snake oil, which is going to cure your disease. And when you think about the way Trump sort of parades in front of the media all the time, this will cure everything. It's going to disappear in a day. The vaccines don't mean anything. It's like he is Dr. Trump selling you his elixir for whatever it is of the day. He really is a modern day uh, snake oil salesman. And yet he was able to declare an emergency here for the pandemic, which allowed um, Rick Bright and the people at the FDA and his bosses to do all sorts of unusual things that they would not normally be able to do in order to win approval for these drugs or to get approval for these therapies that uh, Dr. Trump says will cure the pandemic. So by now you know that Dr. Bright has appeared in front of the uh, House Committee. He was there for a rev very riveting three hours yesterday, detailing what was an extraordinary uh, list of circumstances that were really kind of depressing to listen to because 
In, in general, what he's saying is that there's an enormous amount of corruption going on, an enormous amount of corruption going on in relation to this crisis, the worst crisis we've ever had to deal with from a public health perspective. He says that um, politics and cronyism have been put ahead of science at that, uh, not only at BARDA, he's talking specifically around um, the, the, the Department of Health and Human Services, but also at the FDA. He says potentially dangerous drugs have been promoted by those with political connections. He says this has been going on for years, actually. This is not something that's just happened because of this pandemic. It's been going on for a very, very long time. Those are the two sort of key claims to take away. When you start reading the detail, it gets even more interesting, and we'll go to, into them in a few minutes. But the bottom line is there are connected folk inside these organizations um, that are also connected to the, you know, the pharma sector and all these other companies and all these other influential sectors, and they've been able to approve drugs that are just plainly not good for you or they might kill you, depending on which ones they are. And the one that may kill you is hydroxychloroquine. You've heard about it many, many times. Hydroxychloroquine is uh, probably Donald Trump's favorite drug in the sector of, of you know, snake oil that will cure the pandemic. Uh, and he's been pushing it for a very long time. There are a multitude of reasons why he might have been choosing to, to deal with hydroxychloroquine, but the key one that we think matters the most, or I think matters the most, is really around his ownership of um, a large chunk of shares from Sanofi, the French pharmaceutical company. Let's take a look at how it all breaks down within um, Donald Trump's universe. These are the very many ways that Donald Trump is tied to hydroxychloroquine, the malaria drug that he thinks will cure the pandemic, but which may kill you. Hydroxychloroquine is made by Sanofi, the French pharma company, and Novartis. Trump's former lawyer, Michael Cohen, had a $1.2 million consulting deal with Novartis, paid through his essential consulting company. That's the very same company that Cohen used to pay off Stormy Daniels. Donald Trump owns a significant stake in Sanofi through mutual funds called Dodge and Cox. And at least three of the companies that stand to benefit from the generic form of hydroxychloroquine are also connected to Trump. Hydroxychloroquine is made by Sanofi, the French pharma company, and Novartis. Trump's former lawyer, Michael Cohen, had a 1.2 million... Yes, yes, you did see it twice. I apologize for that. What's going on is I'm trying to put this lovely layer of graphics on top of my uh, camera, and uh, it didn't work the first time, so I had to try something different. So what we're looking at here is, you know, did you ever think I could fit a Stormy Daniels and uh, coronavirus uh, segment in one, and I've been able to do it there? There's Stormy Daniels and Michael Cohen, who may or may not ever be released from prison, but hopefully will get will come out soon and be able to tell us what's going on in a new book that he's planning to publish. Um, but you can see that uh, Donald Trump loves hydroxychloroquine because he's tied to Novartis and he's tied to Sanofi, but he's also tied to this little sector over here. Where is it? This side. There's Teva, Mylan, and uh, I can't read that. Farmer's Source or something. I'll get it to you in a second because I have it on another slide where I can actually read in the front and the font isn't too small. I'm going to break down this for you um, company by company because each of these brands you, or these company names you may have heard of before, but they are each individually tied to Donald Trump as well. And that to me raises you know, a lot of concern about how this one president seems to be tied to so many companies related to a drug that he loves so much that he pushed so many times. So here's the slide. Um, uh, that's not the right, sorry, one second here. Here we go. So there are, you know, the generic sector is huge. It's getting bigger and bigger all the time. A lot of these drugs are actually made in India or other parts of the world, Pakistan. Uh, they are mostly effective, but the quality might be very different. You know, it's unsure. We're not sure when you get a generic drug what exactly you're getting. It's not the, not as regulated as the as the traditional drugs are, as the main drugs are. The FDA does do some investigations of these sites, but it's not the same. So, you know, it's from a quality perspective, there are some questions around what Teva, Mylan, or Pharmasphere um, says and does um, in, those, in those pharmaceutical um, factories that they have. Mostly these seem to work okay. Mostly they're fine, but they're not your sort of, your, your, 
just your standard that you want to be doing research on, which is what a lot of what BARDA does is the research. So let's look at these three companies here that are somehow connected to the White House. There's Israel's Teva Pharmaceuticals. Um, Teva has a, a, you know, an interesting history because um, I think they're the company, that's my land, sorry. So Teva has an interesting history because they've been doing a lot of interesting generic uh, production over the last few years. Um, they're also connected to Jared Kushner. So the way it works is one of their board members through their CEO is connected to Jared Kushner and through whatever connect, contacts they have, they were able to push hydroxychloroquine up through um, the administration by using contacts with Jared Kushner. Nothing untowards there, except there is some connection there. It may be more than just a contact, it may be financial or related to Oscar, we don't know, but that's what we have a sense around. Then there's Mylan. Mylan's an interesting company because it makes a ton of generics. It also, you'll remember, was involved in that EpiPen scandal last year or the year before. Maybe it was 2016. Time flies when you're having fun. But the, um, the EpiPen scandal is basically them bilking Medicare to the tune of $500 million or, or, or more in order to sell this generic version of, of the EpiPen um, for ridiculously increased prices to... Um, to the, Medicare, uh, to the Medicare administration. And so one of the interesting things I discovered recently about Mylan is it's actually run by Heather Rauch, I think is how you say her name. She's the CEO. She's also John Manchin's daughter. Now, John Manchin is a Democrat senator from West Virginia. He's also described as Donald Trump's favorite Democrat senator. And maybe he is that because of this, because his daughter breaks in. I mean, she makes so much money. It's obscene uh, how much money they make over at Mylan. But uh, as the CEO of that company, Heather Roach makes a lot of money. Now, in fairness, in West Virginia, uh, Mylan hires a lot of people, 3,000 people or more. Um, it will soon be merged with Pfizer's Upjohn to create an even bigger uh, generic company. And they're you know, mostly considered an American success story until you realize that it's, oh, Heather Rauch, that's interesting, that she's John Manchin's daughter and she happens to run Mylan. The other person who's really uh, tightly involved with Donald Trump is, uh, is it John Pizza or Joe Pizza? Let me just uh, do this so we can take a better look at it here. Hang on one second, whoops. Um, well, I can't, it doesn't really help you very much because I still can't see it properly because my eyes are so small on the screen. I'm looking at it is even smaller. My eyes are hard to see sorry um one second so it says uh it's joe pizza there you go so joseph pizza uh um donated i think it was fifty thousand dollars to america first action that was one of the political action committees that the Donald Trump ran under that was supporting Donald Trump during the 2016 campaign so he paid fifty thousand dollars there Teva, I mentioned earlier, their CEO, Robert Mignon, I'm not sure how you say that, but he was approaching um, uh, Kushner about getting hydroxychloroquine approved by the government. And then you've got Mylan, who's John Manchin's daughter, who's the CEO, and she's the person who was helping uh, navigate, uh, I guess, government relations for that company. And how easy is that when you can just go to your boss or to your dad, who happens to be the senator from West Virginia? Okay, so, um, boy, I warned you tonight's show is going to be a little bit uh, difficult to maneuver uh, because I have a lot of moving parts and a lot of talking to do. So uh, let's see what's next here. Um, okay, so I guess the best thing to do right now is to remind you about Jared Kushner, because you'll remember that in the show a few weeks ago when we talked about uh, the 19 days that changed the world, I told you a lot about Jared Kushner's support for his brother's company, Oscar, which he used to own a big piece of. It seems what he was doing as he was creating this uh, task force around testing was actually just providing his brother's company and other associates, all the business to do that testing 
that he was developing with his task force. It's a very unseemly bit of business. Um, and now we're learning that there's even more, that Jared Kushner was involved all the way up and down in Barda in trying to um, approve funding for certain drugs and treatments. Let's go back to the show a few weeks ago. I'll run that clip and then uh, we'll come back and talk about how he's doing it now. Being the purview of Jared Kushner, the president's son-in-law. Kushner's whole thing is about using technology and innovation to solve big government's problems. And that's generally a very good idea. Except the company he's chosen to work with are mostly connected in one way or another to his brother Joshua Kushner and his company, Oscar. The first step is to complete an online screener based on guidelines from public health officials. So does Jared himself stand to profit from coronavirus? It sure looks like that. Jared used to own a big piece of Oscar. He says he's divested of it, but really there's no way of knowing if he's done that or not. So, you know, it clear to me that after we aired that and after other media outlets exposed what Jared Kushner was doing, uh, Oscar pulled out of any relationship to do with the task force, which is probably a good thing because it seemed very unseemly. But there, you know, it was just the tip of the iceberg, as it turns out. So many other things that Donald, that uh, Jared Kushner has been doing has been influencing events within BARDA. Now, there are two um, drugs in question here related to hydrox hydroxychloroquine. There's hydroxychloroquine and then there's remesivir, which is the former HIV drug that has been used against uh, viruses of different forms and is now being tested against coronavirus and turning out to be fairly successful. But I want to show you what happens in a in the market because this is the thing I think it's missed most about the um, the Rick Bright allegations is we're talking about the market um, moving dramatically. So when you've got someone like um, the FDA or the or Barda investigating whether to spend money to investigate and to research hydroxychloroquine or to investigate or research remdesivir, what they do is it has a huge impact on the share price. And you can see what happened here, where you see the dark blue line or the purple line, I guess, sort of deviating from where the stock was going, it, it tanked dramatically at that point. You can see it losing a huge amount of share, um, of share price. That company is Novartis, which is the company Michael Cohen uh, paid the $1.2 million or got the $1.2 million lobbying contract from. And you can see what's happening over there. It's really interesting that when it turned out that they were not going to get that funding from BARDA and the FDA, their prices started to plummet on the shares uh, in terms of the share price. And then came the turnaround. That's when Dr. Bright said, hey, we will do some testing around this re around hydroxychloroquine because there is a little bit of evidence that it might work. It's also when the president was pushing, pushing, pushing heavily to get hydroxychloroquine approved by BARDA. And you can see the turnaround immediately. Novartis's price started trending upwards. Same thing, but a little bit different because it's in reverse. And this time, um, on the on the light blue line or the blue line, is um, Gilead. Gilead makes remdesivir, and you can see that it is growing well as it's researching through normal channels, gets approved by BARDA and the FDA. It hits a bit of a speed bump and the stock price declines a little bit, but it ultimately recovers as new evidence showing that the stock prices, um, that the research is coming uh, through well and that it's proving to be a positive result. So you can see there through the, sh through the share prices that what we're dealing with is not just approval for the, the products themselves and for the sales of these medications. It's true that you know, hydroxychloroquine, thousands of if not millions of doses were bought and remesivir, millions of doses are being made. But the, the, the thing that's also happening along at the same time is that the share price is fluctuating. Now, if you're a good stock market trader, I'm terrible. I'm not invested in the stock price, in any stock market, because I just don't ever make any money off it and I just don't know how to read them. But if you're good at this kind of stuff or you have your ear to the ground, I guess what you can do is predict the prices going up, predict the prices going down. If you're one of the people who's making the moves that might make the prices go up and make the prices go down, boy, can you make a lot of money if you make these predictions accurately. So the other thing that needs to be investigated here is whether the president or his son-in-law or the insiders or everybody else was benefiting by dumping their shares or buying these shares at different times. And of course, there is an investigation going on about just that, and we'll get to that in just a second. There's more about um, Jared Kushner that we should tell you about, because according to Dr. Bright, 
I should throw this up for you because it'll be a little easier to understand by looking at this. So there's Dr. Rick Bright, who honestly is one of, who's just a hero by any stretch of imagination. This guy is not just a whistleblower in the, in, in the, in the modern sense of the term, which is going to be anybody. He is an absolute hero because what he's done is against you know, a career that has been tremendous and brilliant and, and incredibly successful. He's gone out and faced you know, the president of the United States and revealed the secrets of the pharmaceutical lobby, which have been you know, tremendous and harsh um, in, in the many years that they've been able to get away with this. And one of the things you have to hope that comes out of this is that we take another look at how these medications are approved. What are the processes that go through? How do we know that the pharma lobby is not so big that it is creating you know, disease in order to get medicines out to market. It's quite possible that we are actually in that kind of um, Ayn Randist post, post reality phase where um, the regulations have taken over um, everything. And that's why these sort of uh, pharmaceutical sectors and this, and this pharma companies are making so much money. I'm going to let you stare at the slide for a second while I try to figure out uh, some of the things I need to share with you about these about the slide. So, if you believe Dr. Bright, and one should believe him because he seems pretty uh, real, and there's absolutely no reason for him to have done this unless you believe him, he says that his boss, <clears throat> excuse me, that his boss, Dr. Robert Cadillac, uh, who was fairly new, he's part of the new administration, came in I think in around 2016, but. Um, it, He's expanded his role over the years. Robert Cadillac is now the Assistant Secretary for Preparedness and Response in the U.S. government. What's interesting about Robert Cadillac, and that's why I have a Richard Burr on the other side of there, is because Robert Cadillac used to work for Richard Burr. Uh, Senator Burr, as you may know, was recently asked by the FBI to turn in his cell phone because that cell phone might have evidence related to a crime. The crime in question might be insider trading related to pharmaceutical companies. So there might be an investigation involving Mr. Cutlack as well. Who knows what kind of communication was going on between Senator Burr and his former, uh, you know, I think he was the uh, an office worker in some form. I don't remember his exact role, but he worked as a, in, in Richard Burr's office or for Richard Burr in, in the Senate. So was there information being passed that allowed Richard Burr and there were a few other senators to sell, to sell their shares just before the coronavirus happened or at least came to the public's attention? We all had assumed it had to do with this briefing that the senators got. But maybe there's more. Maybe there's something going on that we don't know of between Cadillac and Burr behind the scenes and these other senators, which could implicate even more people from the Republican Party in this horrible charade that has gone on, um, which has inflicted so much pain on so many people in this country, while some people, it seems, have profited. Next to Mr. Burr is John Clarici. Mr. Clarici is a lobbyist. This is also one of those things that needs to be investigated in this world where people's lives are at stake. Why do lobbyists get such high regard and why are they able to impact uh, leadership like uh, like Mr. Cadillac, who's the assistant secretary, why is John Sirici uh, go, even having any contact with Mr. Cadillac? He's a political appointee. Why is he there telling Mr. Cadillac what to approve and what not to approve? Because that is exactly what happened. John Clarici is a guy who also, by the way, freelances or is on the board of uh, Alias, one of the companies that got approved during this time for a drug. He's a guy who's making millions of dollars for these companies by lobbying our administration for your money. And then he's got all these contacts that uh, seem unseemly, at least to me, you know, that he has contacts with the assistant, assistant secretary. It just seems wrong. Um, he also is, by the way, a person that Rick Bright describes in at least one example. Mr. Uh, Clarici wanted to get one of his client's contracts extended. That country, um, the company in question, there was a company called Alias. Um, Dr. Bright did not want to extend this contract because it didn't seem to be doing what it needed to do. And there's some questions about the manufacturing, there's questions about the drug itself. And he, in turn, alleged that Clarici told him that he had to approve the contract or the renewal of the contract because 
the CEO of the company, John McManus, who you see there next to Rick Bright, is a friend of Jared Kushner. We don't know if that's true because John McManus says he's never heard of Jared, or doesn't know Jared Kushner, he's heard of him, but does not know Jared Kushner. So either uh, John McManus is lying and he's a good friend of Jared Kushner, which if anybody knows, DM me, let me know if you've got pictures of these guys hanging out or any other sort of contact I'm, I'm really curious about. Or it seems that, uh, you know, it's, there's real potential here that John McManus and John Clarici did try to force Rick Bright to uh, reapprove this contract by alias. And if they did do that, you know, potentially more insider trading, potentially more concern about the amount of graft that's going on inside BARDA. So that's that. It sure, sure looks to me like if you were one of these senators, uh, Burrow is one of them. I know um, I can't th their names are not going to come off, come to me right away. But there are four senators, particularly in question, that uh, must be a little bit nervous right now whether the investigation into insider trading related to coronavirus extends beyond just Richard Burr's cell phone. Because it sure looks like that hearing that Rick Bright did so well yesterday. If you read the background documentation around it, there seems to be allegations of actual criminal activity, criminal activity involving um, some of these companies that got approval through barter. And we're talking about companies that uh, involve the N95 masks, about the stockpile, um, and about all these ones that do treatments and therapies as well. So it's uh, interesting to watch. We should keep an eye out on those and see what happens. Um, also, interestingly enough, just I did a date check before we came on here because this friendship of Jared Kushner and this approval by alias, we're talking about 2017. Now, if you remember correctly, there was a period of time there uh, prior to, I think, September 2017, where both Ivanka and Jared were using their private email accounts. You remember that? But her emails, remember that? Could come back and haunt them in 2020 because but her emails might belong this time to Ivanka Trump and maybe Jared Kushner because they both had a private email server and in that server may be evidence, I believe, I think, I suspect, I don't know, I'm guessing, um, might be evidence of um, Mr. Kushner's involvement with uh, perhaps some of these approvals through BARDA. We'll have to see what happens there. Um, those are interesting facts. Some of them is speculation. The end part, in part, there was total speculation. Um, but we'll keep an eye out on that. And if anyone has any ideas about how that connects, feel free to uh, DM me and I'll share those with you as well. Now, back to where we were last week. So uh, on, this, on the show when I did the, the 19 days to um, 90, 90 days that changed the world. I mentioned Thermo Fisher a lot. Thermo Fisher is one of those companies that requires a ton of attention. Thermo Fisher, uh, I believe, was only was one of the reasons that Donald Trump decided to finally call the pandemic a national emergency because that's what he did um, on March 13th. Now, as I mentioned earlier, the minute something is called a national emergency, it gives new authority to the FDA and BARDA and other institutions like FEMA, the authority to do things that they could only do in an emergency situation. So what it appears like to me is that there was a takeover attempt, in fact, a takeover, uh, a full-on acquisition that happened between uh, Thermo Fisher and a company called Kiagen. Kiagen was finally approved, that sale went through, and just as it went through, Donald Trump decided, well, okay, now I can give you the emergency regulation that you've been wanting, and within 24 hours, Thermo Fisher got that approval. Now, that might seem straightforward, sure. Why, well, you know, he had, he had a reason to introduce the emergency regulations. So Thermo Fisher was one of the testing companies. They were going to be one of the companies that was going to deliver all these tests to America um, for this crisis. We know now that testing didn't quite work out the way they were planning either, but I found out something really interesting about Thermo Fisher when I started digging around. I mean, they have a long history with Donald Trump. Earlier on, I mentioned Sanofi, that it, uh, Donald Trump owned shares in Sanofi. Well, Donald Trump also used to own shares in Thermo Fisher. He says he divested of those shares. But in 2017, he goes on a trip to China and he brings the CEO of Thermo Fisher China with him and more. So let's take a look at what Thermo Fisher's really, really tarnished history in China looks like. <laughs> 
Thermo Fisher specializes in genetic sequencing equipment, which the Chinese government uses to map the genes of Chinese people. In Xinjiang, where the government is engaged in a brutal crackdown of ethnic Uyghurs, the genetic tests were done in hiding, cynically advertised as physicals for all. Instead of saving lives, the sequences were used for the unjust prosecution of Uyghur, Han, and Tibetan people. Thermo Fisher says they've stopped selling the devices to Xinjiang, but who knows if that's really the case. China says there's really no substitute for Thermo Fisher's genetic equipment and claims they need the equipment to fight terrorism. The company is very proud of all of this. It says that China is their greatest success story in the emerging world. Indeed, when Donald Trump undertook his first visit to China in 2017, he took along the CEO of Thermo Fisher China, Gianluca Petiti. Here's a photo from Petiti's Instagram feed with President Trump and President Xi behind Trump's shoulder. While there, Petiti signed $35 million worth of deals with Chinese universities and companies. Now, he's now been reassigned to another part of the company, but his replacement is just as fawning of the Chinese president for life, Xi Jinping. I like that music a lot. I wish I could have it following me around wherever I went. Um, seriously, though, this is a dark, dark moment for Thermo Fisher. You can't understate how awful the conditions are for the Uyghurs in in Xinjiang, Xinjiang, I should say, because in fact they're very. Uh, it's a level of suppression and surveillance that we have not seen anywhere else in the world for a very well, never really, because it's it's so invasive and so technical. But the what's going on with over a million Uyghurs who are currently still in concentration camps, maybe more. You might call them concentration camps. They'll say they're training camps or retraining camps or whatever other words they want to use. But there's no doubt that what's going on in that province. Firstly, it's happening without any uh, foreign witnesses. Very few people are allowed there. Very few people know what's going on. Those people who have relatives that live there or escaped tell people in the West how awful the situation is. Every move is monitored. Every, um, every app that, they're, that they're, is installed on people's phones turns out to be surveillance apps. Everything they do on their mobile phones, every interactions they have, every time they meet with people, it gets a, a, you know, monitored and noted by the police. It's a sign of the terrible oppression that the Chinese will ultimately hope to export to the rest of the world as their system of government, which is preferable to democracy, they say, starts taking over the world. And it has been seen and, and criticized by many, but very few people have been able to go do to visit the area, but also very few people have any leverage over the Chinese government. So it's very hard for foreign governments to start intervening in what's going on in Xinjiang. But they could, they could ban companies from their countries from having anything to do with what's going on in Xinjiang. That's not what's going on, unfortunately. What's going on in Xinjiang is being funded and at least um, equipped by companies from the United States. Now, what we saw in that story, the New York Times story in 2019, this was exposed. The company says they no longer sell their genetic sequencing equipment to the government in Xinjiang. But who knows if that's true? Who knows? Um, we have no way of telling whether that genetic sequencing is going on. You know, that cynical, awful way the Chinese have decided to pitch this to the Uyghurs and that we're, this is physicals for all when it really is just uh, a genetic monitoring system so they can figure out um, who does what in their society, I guess. Uh, it's just a very dark dystopian image of the way the world looks in Chinese eyes and also the one they want to export to all of us in the rest of the world as they become more dominant. Thermo Fisher should have stopped doing things in China right away. They should have said, absolutely, we will not sell any genetic equipment, anything to the Chinese government. But in fact, they didn't even go very far at all. All they said was, we'll stop selling it to that particular province, which means there's a million other ways that they could have gotten to that province and to the police in that province to do what they need to do. So that's the more Fisher strike one. I'm going to show you another American run or at least American led company that has a relationship with uh, what's going on with the Uyghurs that's actually tied to the Trump administration in a second. But I, I should mention another thing because 
all of this, you know, when you start unraveling this thing, it just becomes very apparent that you're looking at just one web of very similar companies and people and financing structures that all seem to convene um, around Trump. And Thermo Fisher is one of these companies that keeps coming up again and again and again. Now, when I told you about what happened in Wuhan, which was um, a couple of shows ago, I mentioned this particular general, General Chen Wei, or Wei Chen. I say Wei Chen because I know the last names uh, when anglicized are, are last, but in, in China, the last names are first. So you might see her name as, as, as Major General Chen Wei or Major General Wei Chen. Both are actually correct. Now, General Chen is very much the leader in the world right now in terms of developing a vaccine for the coronavirus. She was... Uh, she's only in that position because she was there first. You know, she was able to get to the location in Wuhan where nobody else was. She seemed to have access to the lab where maybe or maybe not the virus emerged. Um, so she was able to develop a vaccine pretty quickly. Um, that vaccine may in fact be the first vaccine that's available for all of humanity. And that vaccine um, may go to, or will go to the company that she's working with, which is the company called Cansino Biologics. General Chen works for the People's Liberation Army. She's a member of the Chinese Communist Party's army. That's what her daytime job is, but she's doing research with Cansino Biologics. Cansino Biologics is going to make a lot of money if they are first to market with a vaccine. And boy, will it be amazing if they sell that vaccine to the entire world. They'll make a fortune of that. Now, who else is going to benefit from making that money? Uh, well, there's two companies in particular. One is Cidic, who underwrites a lot of this, and the other, you're going to have to think back to the first story of the day today, and then I'm going to let play the tape, and you'll see how all of this wedge sort of converges in a very dramatic and interesting way. Now, let's go back to the Uyghurs, because there's another company that you've learned about on this show that has ties to the Uyghurs, um, and it also involves Eric Prince. So, uh, let me put this here, and... Um, in one second, here we go. Now, avid viewers of this program will recall that we exposed former Blackwater CEO Eric Prince's ties to an Israeli operative slash startup founder from the company Carbon. Their new boss at Frontier Resources Group was China's Zhenming Chang. He's very close to Xi Jinping. And it was under Chang that Prince's Frontier Resources Group began building these training centers or camps in China's Xinjiang province where the Uyghurs are being surveilled. Now Chang is the former chairman of Citic Group, which is like Goldman Sachs in China. They're involved in a lot of the big deals. So perhaps it's coincidental, but it turns out that Citic Group is underwriting Cansino Biologics. Now you'll remember we told you about this company a couple of weeks ago when we told you about General Wei Chen. She's the major general in the People's Liberation Army that is developing the vaccine for coronavirus. It turns out that two of the founders from Cansino Biologics hail from French pharma company Sanofi. So there's obviously a reason why none of this is out there in the public sphere in a big way, because it's very complicated. Um, but I think that there's evidence there to suggest that there could be a real connection between Sanofi and Cansino Biologics, which would be fascinating. Because if the two executives and uh, of, of uh, formerly of Sanofi are now running this particular company, Cansino Biologics, that is working with the Chinese government to develop a vaccine of this enormous scale that could be worth billions and billions of dollars, um, that would be interesting. Now, that doesn't mean that Sanofi is gonna be the company that ultimately works with um, Cansino Biologics to, to send this uh, vi the vaccine around the world. Um, there's also Thermo Fisher, which I mentioned earlier on. It turns out that Thermo Fisher is building out $500 million worth of new facilities in the United States in order to fund what they say is vector research. Now, here's the announcement that came out a few weeks ago. So vector research is interesting because there are various types of ways you can make a vaccine. 
And it turns out that the way that thermo, that uh, General Wei Chen is making her vaccine is using something called a vector. I have no idea what a vector is, but uh, it this. In order to make these vector vaccines, you need to build out your vector facilities. And this is what Thermo Fisher is doing. I'm speculating here again, is Thermo Fisher Scientific about to make a run on Casino Biologics? Or are they the company that's going to make the vaccines once they get approval from, um, from the Chinese for this uh, vaccine the People's Liberation Army is, is working on? And if that's the case, how did people know? How did people know so many months ago that her vaccine was going to be the right one? How did they know to start building out these, this, these facilities? How did they know that they needed to expand in the vector sphere? It seems to me a little bit more than coincidental. And so we really need to start digging into uh, the relationship between um, General Chen and Cansino and the relationship between Thermo Fisher, the Chinese government, Thermo Fisher and Donald Trump, and then also their interest maybe in the vaccine space. Certainly a lot of interesting things to keep in mind there. And then we should also be looking at Sanofi, because if Sanofi is the company that ultimately lets two of its executives go off and start a company in, in China related to making vaccines, and it's purely independent, fine. But there's a reason Donald Trump still holds on to those Sanofi shares when he got rid of his Thermo Fisher shares. He must see a lot of value in those Sanofi shares. And I think it's worth watching to see what happens if, um, if all of this web sort of converges into a giant uh, bit of evidence to reveal who is making so much money of this incredibly traumatic pandemic that is affecting all of us. Boy, we've done a lot today. We've covered a lot of territory. And I'm, uh, I know some of this is very confusing. It certainly is confusing for me. But to, to put it simply, you know, there are, by my count, including Abbott, which, by the way, is the, is the testing company, which made one of these tests that has now been proven to be 50% wrong all the time. Um, it's just shocking that people are buying these products for our government on, with your money to cure you, and they do not work because there's such a rush to get something done uh, that we're making all these mistakes along the way. Uh, and yet, inside the administration, there are people pushing these products that are clearly either useless or dangerous, who knows, on Americans. And we really need to take a step back and take a look at why there is so much mismanagement of that, um, of the $6 trillion or more that you've now spent on, on saving America through your tax money. Um, but there are five, let's say, now big reasons that we can find that link Donald Trump to the pharma lobby that he admires so much. You know, he's always been a fan of how they do what they do, and now we can see why, because in fact, the, they're, you know, they're not unlike the mob um, in the way they operate. So you've got Abbott Laboratories, you've got Thermo Fisher Scientific, we've discussed at length, you've got Cansino, that's the manufacturer of the vaccine, you've got Novartis, it's tied to Sanofi, tied to Michael Cohen, tied to Stormy Daniels, and then you've got Sanofi itself. So you've got, you know, if this was poker, a royal flush, right? I mean, you've got a full hand there of winners for Donald Trump out of a vaccine, which may be devastating to America, but is making uh, Donald Trump potentially very, very wealthy. God knows what other payments are going on behind the scenes to maybe endorse this. And then of course, there's what Jared's doing and what Ivanka's doing. There's a lot that comes out of that uh, incredible briefing um, or testimony from Rick Bright uh, yesterday in front of the House, a very brave and remarkable thing that he did. Uh, go back and read the, uh, the whistleblower reports directly. You'll find a lot of interesting information there. And um, for those of you out there interested in this independent sleuthing thing, uh, any information that you get about uh, Sanofi, Novartis, Consino, or Thermo Fisher's desires around uh, entering the vaccine market and also about Abbott, there is a good trail there. And regarding Jared Kushner, see if you can find anything um, related to Alias and some of these other companies that got approval based on the fact that he was friends with the CEO. There's much more to all of this, and we'll keep that all for another day. That's enough for today, certainly for my mind. Uh, thank you very much for watching Narrative Live. As always, please go to patreon.com forward slash narrative and join the team. Join us uh, because uh, you, you get to meet a good bunch of people in a great community. It's five bucks a month. All you do is you, uh, you sign up there. You can cancel at any time. 
and it really is the only funding I get to do the work I do, which is not nearly enough to cover what I do, but I feel like it's a, it's important for the world and history right now that we have as many eyes looking for the truth as possible in a time that is of real consequence to the American people, and in fact, the world. So uh, patreon.com forward slash narrative, promise me you'll go. Uh, five bucks a month is what it costs. And also, if you like, uh, sign up to the YouTube channel, which we just recently rebranded. Um, if you can, uh, subscribe to that channel by hitting the subscribe button. It really helps um, build the audience a lot. And uh, all of you who get, who get the podcast, the podcast version of this will be out in the next couple of days. Uh, the video version is available on Apple, or if you're an iOS user on your iPhone, or, I, or tablet, or even Apple TV. The audio version available on most podcast players, including Spotify. Thanks for watching this edition of Narrative Live. This has been Snake Oil.